Thanks especially to each of you for lending an ear. I am honored to be here. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have backed a project on Kickstarter, the funding platform for creativity? Okay, looks like about half of you. And let me ask you another question. How many of you have bought something on Etsy, the marketplace of things that are made by hand? Okay, so, so more than half of you have already participated in a, a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace, or, or in this movement that people now call crowdfunding. DonorsChoose.org uh, began years before crowdfunding was even a word. So I want to tell you the inside story. And I want to tell you the story because more and more small businesses and entrepreneurs are using crowdfunding to raise financing and to connect with their customers. And as I'm telling you the story, I'm going to share the most humiliating thing I ever did so that the next time you make a mistake, you'll be able to say, well, at least it wasn't as bad as what that guy Charles did. <laughs> and at the end, we're going to do something that has never been done before at QuickBooks Connect. Let me ask you one final question. How many of you had a teacher in high school who changed your life? All right, most, most of you, that's great to hear. I had a teacher like that myself. His name was Mr. Buxton. He was my English teacher and my wrestling coach. And when I showed up as a dorky freshman in high school, Mr. Buxton spoke to me like he would to any adult. If he approved or, or disapproved of something I'd done, I knew it right away because he didn't have that mask that some grown-ups have when they're talking to kids. If I asked him a question on Wednesday, he'd come back to me on Friday saying that he'd thought about it, and he really had. He made, you feel, he made you feel like he wanted you on his team. And looking back on it, I think it was Mr. Buxton who made me want to be a teacher. So 14 years ago, I started teaching history at Wings Academy, a public high school in the Bronx. But the school where I was teaching did not have the same resources as when I was in Mr. Buxton's classroom. Where I went to high school, we went on field trips into the woods, we had graphing calculators for trigonometry. We had the supplies to do just about any art project. We did not want for anything. But when I started teaching in the Bronx, I saw firsthand that all schools are not created equal. My colleagues and I would spend a lot of our own money on copy paper and pencils, but we would see our students going without the materials and experiences they needed for a great education. We would talk about books we wanted our students to read, a field trip we wanted to take them on, a pair of microscopes that would let us do a science experiment. And I just figured there must be people out there who'd want to help teachers like us if they could see where their money was going. So using pencil and paper, I drew out a, a website where public school teachers could create classroom project requests and donors could choose a project they wanted to support. For $2,000, a programmer who had recently arrived from Poland was willing to build that site. It was super rudimentary. The back end uh, of this site was one page that you'd have to scroll down for like 15 minutes to get to the teacher or the project that you were looking for to process a donation. Where are the small business owners at? Right. You know, it's funny how we often start off on one path, and as small businesses, we wind up on a completely different path that we never expected we would go down. And, and our next speaker, Charlie Best, I can assure you, he didn't intentionally set out to be a pioneer in crowdfunding. That's for sure. He had great intentions. In fact, in 2000, he had an idea to use the massive transparency and the scale of the web to help teachers. He wanted a way for teachers to be able to get funding for classroom projects that they couldn't afford. Again, the odds were against him. I mean, you want to talk about odds being against you. This guy had zero expertise with technology, zero knowledge about startups and funding, but he didn't let that stop him. In fact, he launched the site donorschoose.org. Have you guys heard of that? People loved it. People loved it. 
And one particular, one person in particular really loved it, so much so, she put it on her list of favorite things. Does the name Oprah Winfrey ring a bell? Not so bad. Let's take a look at his story. Ladies and gentlemen, Charles Best. Thank you, Bill. Thank you so much for that introduction. Thanks especially to each of you for lending an ear. I am honored to be here. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have backed a project on Kickstarter, the funding platform for creativity? Okay, looks like about half of you. And let me ask you another question. How many of you have bought something on Etsy, the marketplace of things that are made by hand? Okay. So, so more than half of you have already participated in a, a peer-to-peer marketplace or, or in this movement that people now call crowdfunding. DonorsChoose.org uh, began years before crowdfunding was even a word. So I want to tell you the inside story. And I want to tell you the story because more and more small businesses and entrepreneurs are using crowdfunding to raise financing and to connect with their customers. And as I'm telling you the story, I'm gonna share the most humiliating thing I ever did so that the next time you make a mistake, you'll be able to say, well, at least it wasn't as bad as what that guy Charles did. And at the end, we're gonna do something that has never been done before at QuickBooks Connect. Let me ask you one final question. How many of you had a teacher in high school who changed your life. All right, most, most of you, that's great to hear. I had a teacher like that myself. His name was Mr. Buxton. He was my English teacher and my wrestling coach. And when I showed up as a dorky freshman in high school, Mr. Buxton spoke to me like he would to any adult. If he approved or, or disapproved of something I'd done, I knew it right away because he didn't have that mask that some grown-ups have when they're talking to kids. If I asked him a question on Wednesday, he'd come back to me on Friday saying that he'd thought about it, and he really had. He made you feel, he made you feel like he wanted you on his team. And looking back on it, I think it was Mr. Buxton who made me want to be a teacher. So 14 years ago, I started teaching 11 happened. And teachers at the schools beside Ground Zero started creating projects on our site to recover from the attacks on the World Trade Center. There was a math teacher whose students' calculators were sealed at the disaster site, and their classroom had been relocated to a basement, so she requested a new set of calculators. There was a high school teacher who wanted to bring in an Afghan artist so that students could learn about Afghanistan was a first grade teacher whose students had been saved by a particular group of firemen. And her students wanted to thank the firemen who had saved them by doing a musical performance in front of their fire ladder company. And for that, they needed musical instruments. There were hundreds of these projects related to 9-11, and I thought that local media would jump on this story. This was right when uh, people yearned to participate in the 9-11 recovery effort. The Red Cross had almost too many blood donations, and here was this direct way for people to help. But I must have called 100 reporters, and none of them would give me the time of day. None of them would talk to me. So I figured, I, figured I, I better aim higher. The Holy Grail was the New York Times, they had a new reporter covering nonprofits and philanthropy. Her name was Stephanie Strom. And I figured if we could get Stephanie Strom of the New York Times to do a story about our site, we would have a shot at big time impact. So I put together a package of materials and I mailed them off to Stephanie. Didn't hear back. So a few weeks later, I called her up and she was nice, uh, but she said that we were awfully small potatoes. 
She said, you know, if ever I'm, I'm doing a, a story on online charities, which at the time was still a, a new concept, maybe, maybe I'll put you on that list, but I'm, I'm afraid you're not, you're not exactly newsworthy. Damn. Then I found a directory of the top people at Newsweek, and I called the senior editor there. His name was Jonathan Alter. I called him first because uh, with a last name beginning with A, he showed up first in the alphabetical directory. I called him during my lunch hour, and his assistant must have been out to lunch because he picked up the phone. And I said, hey, I'm a teacher up in the Bronx. I started this nonprofit with my students. Do you want to hear about it? And he said, sure. He didn't hang up on me. We talked for 45 minutes, and that night, he wrote a column for the Newsweek website saying that this experiment growing out of a Bronx classroom might one day change philanthropy. So then I called up Stephanie Strom at the New York Times, all excited, and, and, I, and I said, hey, Newsweek saw us as newsworthy, at least for their website, so, so won't you give us a second look? And then she dashed my hopes. She said, I wouldn't touch your story with a 10-foot pole now that another reporter has covered you. The New York Times does not follow in the footsteps of other publications. Oh. I felt like an idiot for having told her that another media outlet had broken our story, and I sent her an email apologizing for, for being so dumb. Stephanie took pity on me. She could see how badly I felt. She wrote back, and she said that I shouldn't feel quite so bad because I didn't have a chance in the first place. <laughs> because, because her editors had asked her to focus on charities responding to 9-11. So there was my last opening. I spent hours, I, I crafted this email to Stephanie telling her about all the projects that teachers beside Ground Zero were creating on our site. And I called her up, I called her up over the weekend, so I would go straight to voicemail and not interrupt her while she was on deadline. And I said, this is the last, the last time you'll ever hear from me. If you could just read this one final pitch. Monday, I was back at school teaching, and I checked my email in between periods. Stephanie had written back, she wanted to come do an interview for a major feature story in the New York Times. Now, let me tell you, I was over the moon. My, my parents raised me to be humble, but this was the New York Times. It felt like the skies had opened and I had to shout. So I forwarded Stephanie's email to my friend and I said, guess who said she wouldn't touch our story with a 10-foot pole and now wants an interview? That's what hustling will get you. I beat my chest. I talked all kinds of smack. I, I thought that I'd hit forward. <laughs> I'd, I, I'd hit reply. And the, the moment I realized, I, I yanked the electrical cord out of the socket to turn off the computer. But it was too late. I sent that trash-talking, chest-beating email to Stephanie Strom, philanthropy reporter for the New York Times. So naturally, I sent her another email apologizing for being so dumb. And to Stephanie's eternal credit and mercy, she did not hold it against me. She went on to write uh, a story, a major feature story for the New York Times, arguing that donorschoose.org uh, would be the future of philanthropy.